Hi there, I'm Fido, your trusty AI pup on a mission to make data fun. Today, we're diving into a topic that might seem a little dry at first, but stick with me. It's actually way more exciting than it sounds. We are talking about data pre-processing and to help us decode this crucial but often overlooked step in the world of prediction. It's the foundation upon which those brilliant moments are built when your model actually gets things right. Our deep dig today is gonna to center around chapter three, which really gets into the nitty gritty of how adding, tweaking, or even sometimes removing bits of your training data can totally change how well a model predicts. All right, so imagine this. You're getting ready for a big walk in the park. Super exciting, right? Was the first thing you do, you gotta put on the leash, right? Maybe a quick potty break before you head out. It's data pre-processing, getting everything in order before the fun begins. You wouldn't just bolt out the door without a leash, would you? Just like some paths in the park are easier for different kinds of paws. Some models are better suited for certain types of data. The chapter talks about how models like those based on decision trees are a bit less fussy about the data they're fed. Those tree-based models, they're like the all-terrain vehicles of the data world. They can handle pretty much any kind of path you throw at them. But then you've got those models like linear regression. They're a bit more sensitive. They need the data to be just right to really strut their stuff. So let's dig a little deeper into some of these data characteristics that can really make or break a model's performance. What does it mean for data to be skewed? Let me explain it using an analogy that all dog lovers can understand. Think of it this way. Imagine you've got a big bowl of treats. Mm-hmm. Mostly, they're all normal sized. But then there's one huge G-bone in there. That's skewness. It's when the data is kind of lopsided with most of the values bunched up in one place and then a few way out there on their own. So that one big bone kind of throws off the whole picture, right? It makes it really hard to figure out what the average treat size actually is because that big bone is distorting things. Another way to explain skewness. It's like trying to judge the average height of dogs in a park, but there's a great Dane among a pack of Chihuahuas. The Dane doesn't just stand out. It pulls the whole height distribution to the right making it seem like dogs are taller on average than they really are. That's skewness in action. How do we deal with these big bones in our data? The chapter mentions transformations like log, square root, or inverse. They're like finding clever ways to break down that big bone into more manageable pieces, so you can actually get a good sense of the overall treat situation. A log transformation, for example, is like taking that huge bone and sawing it into a bunch of smaller, bone-shaped treats. You're basically squishing down the range of those really big values so they don't overshadow everything else. The chapter actually gave a cool example of this with cell segmentation data, where the intensity of actin filaments was heavily skewed toward higher values and a log transformation really helped to balance things out. You're making the data more representative of the real picture. Yeah, and they even mention this thing called the Box Cox transformation, which is like having a special tool that automatically finds the best way to break down that bone. It figures out the optimal transformation, so you don't have to do it manually. Now, what about outliers? What are those in the world of dogs? Think of it like this. You're at the dog park and most of the dogs are doing normal dog things, right? Playing, fetch, sniffing around. But then there's one dog that's doing backflips and balancing a ball on its nose. That's an outlier, a data point that's way different from all the others. The oddball of the data set, right? Sometimes that outlier is a legitimate case, like maybe that dog is actually a trained performer, but other times it could be a mistake in the data, like someone accidentally recorded a squirrel's acrobatics instead of a dog's. And these outliers can really mess with our predictions. If we're trying to understand the average dog's behavior, 
That outlier is going to throw us way off, so we need to find ways to deal with them. Right. The chapter talks about the spatial sign transformation. Imagine all the dogs in the park are spread out. The outliers are like way out in the parking lot, far away from everyone else. The spatial sign transformation is like herding all the dogs into a giant circular pen. The dogs that were way out in the parking lot, they're still near the edge of the pen, but they're not as far out there, and they don't have as much influence on where the center of the pack is. But remember, before we do that herding, we need to make sure all the dogs are starting from roughly the same area. That's what centering and scaling is all about. Okay, so we've talked about skewed data and outliers. What about having too much information? Too much information. Is that even possible? But okay, I get it. Imagine you got a dog with a toy basket that's overflowing with toys, but some of those toys are basically the same, right? You might have three tennis balls that are slightly different colors, but they all pretty much do the same thing. So in data terms, what's the equivalent of having three nearly identical tennis balls? It's like having a bunch of predictors that are measuring basically the same thing. They're giving you redundant information, and that can make things confusing. So we need to find a way to streamline things. The chapter introduces this thing called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. Sounds complicated. It's actually not that bad. Think of it like this. PCA is like looking at that overflowing toy basket and figuring out which toys are the absolute favorites, the ones that really capture the essence of playtime. So maybe it's a squeaky ball and a really bouncy rope. Oh, those become your principal components. They're kind of like super toys that combine the best features of all the similar toys. And the chapter mentions that PCA creates uncorrelated components, which can be really helpful for some models. Yup, it's like making sure that your squeaky ball and your bouncy rope aren't always ending up in the same corner of the basket. They represent different independent ways to have fun, but it's important to remember that PCA doesn't know what game you're trying to play. It just looks at the toys and figures out which combinations explain most of the fun. And you gotta make sure you're not just focusing on the biggest toys, just cause they take up more space. That's why centering and scaling the toys is so important. How do you decide how many of these super toys to keep? The chapter talks about using a scree plot. You have to list of all the super toys ranked from your absolute favorite to the ones you barely even sniff at. And then you make a chart that shows how much each toy contributes to playtime. The first few super toys, they're gonna bring a ton of fun. So the line on the chart goes down really steeply. Hmm. But then, as you get to the less loved super toys, the line starts to flatten out. So you usually wanna keep the super toys that correspond to that steep drop, the ones that give you the most bang for your bark. What about missing information? missing information. Hmm. It's like being on a walk and suddenly losing the scent you are following. You're sniffing around, but the trail just disappeared. Now, why did that happen? Was it a really faint scent to begin with? Did something else cover it up? Figuring out those reasons is super important. That's what they call informative. The reason the data is missing can actually tell you something useful. And the chapter talks about sensor data as well. It's like knowing the scent is definitely somewhere behind that big fence. But you can't see through the fence to know exactly where it is. You know it's out there, but you just can't pinpoint it. So what do you do when you've got a lost scent in your data? Well, sometimes the missing scent wasn't that important anyway, and you can still follow the main trail. Some models are pretty good at dealing with a little missing information, but if that missing scent is crucial, you might try to fill it in.
It's like using the other scent and clues around you to make an educated guess about where that lost smell might have gone. They call that imputation. The chapter mentioned techniques like K nearest neighbors in linear models, which are like using the smells of nearby plants, or the direction of the wind to guess where the main scent likely went. But it's important to remember that filling in those gaps is still a guess, and different methods might introduce their own biases. Sometimes understanding why the data is missing can be just as valuable as trying to replace it. So we've covered handling missing information. What about removing information that's not really adding anything? Zero variance predictors. Those are like having a toy that doesn't even squeak. What's the point of that? It's just taking up space in the toy basket. It's a predictor that doesn't give you any useful information at all. So basically, if a predictor is giving you the same value almost all the time, it's probably not telling you much. That's not helpful for making predictions. And remember those super similar toys we talked about earlier. The ones that basically give you the same kind of play. Same idea with highly correlated predictors. They're like two tennis balls that always get you equally excited. You don't really need both of them. Keeping both might not give you much extra information and could even cause problems for some models. So we've talked about removing unhelpful information. What about adding some new information? Creating dummy variables is like breaking down a big tree into smaller, more manageable pieces. Sometimes information that looks like one big category is actually more useful when you break it down. The chapter talked about whether someone has a savings account instead of just a yes or no. You could create separate categories for different levels of savings. Yeah, like small, medium, or large. It's like asking a series of yes or no questions about the tree. Does it fit in one bite? Does it require two bites? You're getting more specific. But we need to be careful not to oversimplify things. The chapter cautions against bidding continuous data. Bidding continuous data, that's like taking all your different delicious treats and mashing them all together into one big blob. You lose all the unique flavors and textures and you might even create artificial distinctions that weren't there before. Models are often much better at figuring out the best groupings on their own based on the data and what you're trying to predict. So the big takeaway here is that preparing our data, carefully cleaning it, transforming it, selecting the right pieces, and sometimes even creating new ones is absolutely essential for getting the most out of our predictive models. It's like making sure all your ingredients are prepped and ready to go before you start baking. Pre-processing is all about setting your models up for success, giving them the best possible information to work with so they can give you the most accurate and reliable answers. Now, go forth and model wisely. And don't forget, if you like this, give a positive review, subscribe, and where's my treat?